A tia e mauri ora ki te whaiao ki te ao mārama, a whakarongo, whakarongo, whakarongo ki te manu e tanga, ki te manu e tanga a tangi nei, tui, 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 tui ia, a tui ai runga, tui ai raro, tui ai roto, a tui ai waho, tui a tātou te here tangata, ko hui hui mai nei i tēnei rā, karongo te pō, karongo te ao, a tia e mauri ora. A tua tai ake, a ko te mātāmo te whakaro, a ke ai uhao ngā mano, a nā tōna mana ki tanga, ko tai e, a kano hi mai, a tātou i tēnei rā, a ki te tautoko, ki te wānanga, ki te kōre roe pāna, ki tēnei kaupapa whakahira hira, a no ere me whai kurorea ki tōna ingoa tapi. A e rere tonu ana ngā roi mata, ki o tātou mate, kei ngā mate i ke ringa i a koutou, kei ngā marae me ngā hapu maha, a haere, haere, haere atura. A rātou ki a rātou, tātou te hunga ora, a koe hui hui mai nei, a nei rā, A te au o ngā mihi, a kia koutou i tēnei wā. A nau mai ki tēnei wānanga i pūrangi o tātou, a rā ko toi tū te whenua. A tua tai ake, a mākui tō tātou hui e tīmata i raro i te manaaki tango ngā o tō tātou matuni te rangi, a no reira me karaki a tātou. A ki mihia te pōranga hua te ao, kia i o rangi, kia i o whenua, kia ngā mata o te ariki, kia mata nuku, kia mata rangi, kia reira koe a tāne te wai ora. Ko ngā maunga ru, ko ngā awa para whenua mea, Heri uta ki tai ki a tangaroa e, ko koe, ko au, ko tāua nei, whiti ao, whiti, whiti ora, ara mai te toki, haumi e, hui e, a tāe ki e. A ko hikurangi te maunga, ko wā pū te awa, ko hora uta te waka, ko ngā tipurau, a tautanga hau i tinga iwi, anō ngā hapu me ngā marae maho ngā iwe irua, a wau, ko hau tapu baika tōku ingoa. And I'm the Vision Mātauranga Māori Knowledge Broker for the Resilience to Nature's Challenge National Science Challenge. Um, and it is my privilege to facilitate or to MC the webinar today. Um, so just a bit about uh, the Resilience to Nature's Challenge. So Kia Mana Waroa Ngā Akina o Te Ao Tūroa is one of uh, 11 national science challenges funded to tackle the big science questions facing Aotearoa New Zealand. Hosted by GNS Science, our purpose is to accelerate Aotearoa New Zealand's resilience to, but more importantly, relationship with our ever-changing taiao. Uh, through innovative, collaborative research, we bring together deep partnerships, transformative research, and mātauranga Māori to provide the new knowledge, tools, and ways of thinking that will help grow our resilience and relationship with the taiao and manage disaster, risk, uh, disaster risks. Whatu ngaro ngaro te tangata, toitu te whenua. As people disappear from sight, the land remains. This whakatauki uh, speaks to the importance of our whenua, which has anchored the purpose of this webinar since its inception. With the ever-increasing challenges brought on by climate change, we look to our past and the lessons left behind from our tipuna to ensure the whenua remains for generations to come. Natural hazards and climate change pose a significant threat to the cultural identity and well-being of Māori in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This webinar brings together researchers and PhD students from across our Resilience Challenge um, who are exploring mātauranga Māori and modern approach, approaches to adaptation <clears throat> and marae resilience. Excuse me. Uh, so this webinar brings together uh, researchers and, uh, and students who are exploring mātauranga Māori and modern approaches to adaptation and marae resilience in face of such challenges. So Ewoma, I hope the popcorn's in the microwave and you've boiled the kira when you've got your cup of tea ready to go. So a few, a few housekeeping or agenda items. Um, so how this is going to work today is our presenters will present on their kaupapa. Following that will be a short break and then we'll finish up with some Q&A. So on that note, at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see a Q&A function. And, and if at any point you have a partai, please pop that into that function along with who you are addressing that partai to, if it's one of them or for all of them, ke te pai, um, and then we will answer those questions after our short intermission. Um, and if we don't get to your partai, fear not, we will make sure that we get those responded to you and sent out via email or we'll reply directly in that chat function as well. So that's pretty much enough from me. I will quickly introduce uh, who our presenters are today uh, in order, and then we'll hand it over to them to start their presentations. So first up, we have Akuhata Bailey Winiata, a PhD student from Waikato University, who will speak to power adaptation in the face of climate change. Secondly, we have Benjamin Jones, a PhD candidate at the University of Auckland, who will address the role of archaeology in studying and recording cultural sites of significance before they lost the sea level rise. So our very own Ross Geller 
Uh, and lastly, the dynamic duo also from the University of Auckland, Hokapu Nuivuko and Tumanako Fa'aoi, who are investigating marae infrastructure resilience and natural hazard events. Nō reirei tiwi, kia au ki ngā kōrero e whaia ke nei, ka huri te rākau kōrero ki a Akuhata Bailey Winiata. Tēnā koe e hoa. Tēnā koe, I'll just share my screen. So kia ora koutou, uh, ko te arua, ko ngā te tūte tawha oku iwi, nō rotura ahau, e noho ana au ki taranga moana, ko Akuhata Bailey Winiata tōku e ngā. So kia ora everyone, I'm Akuhata, PhD student at the University of Waikato. Um, this first slide, Ko Waiaho, who am I? So these are some pictures that are near and dear to me. So I'm based in Taranga at the University of Waikato Taranga campus. Um, originally born and bred from Rotorua, um, went to Hamilton following high school and I did a Bachelor of Science in Earth Science, then a Master's of Science in Earth Science and now my PhD. Um, the photo in the middle is of my mum and dad. Uh, this is a really important photo for me and for my whanau because I was the first from both sides of my mum and, and my dad to go to university. And, um, you know, I just want to pay homage to my whanau because they're really important to my journey and without them I wouldn't be here presenting to you all. So, um, kia ora. So, the topic of my talk, so it's called Adaptation of Path to Climate Change, Business as Usual. And the research in this um, presentation is really about the research I've been conducting over the past couple of years. Um, some of my master's thesis and now my PhD, um, talking about marae resilience, marae adaptation to sea level rise particularly. So yes, I've got some, I'm based at Waikato. I have some supervisors from Waikato as well as some supervisors from Auckland University as well. And to Manako, who is also one of the um, panelists here, is also one of my supervisors. So, so a bit about the re my research positioning. So these are just some photos that um, really highlight the best parts of my work. Uh, the other half of my work, I'm pretty much in my office writing or making maps or doing those uh, tedious things on the computer. But these are some photos that. Um, really speak to what I enjoy most about my research, being able to connect with communities, connect with hapu iwi, as well as um, rangatahi as well. So these uh, two images on the um, each side show some of the work that I've been doing with hapu on the on the left there. Uh, we were looking at sea level rise um, impacts for their marae. So their marae is basically at the back of these rangatahi, and it's very close to the, um, the shore, the, um, the coastline. So these rangatahi, we're looking at, you know, what are the impacts? How can we potentially adapt down marae? Um, the image on the far right there is a um, activity that Shari Gallup, one of my supervisors and I did for our local school within our neighborhood. And um, we were running science projects with these, um, with these rangatahi and getting them really interested and in wanting to know more about um, pursuing sciences as a potential career. And in the middle is sort of the crux of the research that I've been doing over the past couple of years is engaging with communities around sea level rise, climate change, climate change adaptation, um, hosting wānanga, workshops, um, all those good things where we can try to develop these solutions, develop the thinking, have the corridor around what we need to do and how we need to prepare. And this is just getting um, more and more uh, occurring uh, with the more events that we've been having, such as like Cyclone Gabriel. Um, so there's appetite there at the moment for this type of mahi, which is really cool. So in my title, I say business as usual. And what do I mean by that? And I basically mean that Māori and Indigenous peoples globally as well have been experiencing environmental change for millennia. It's not new. We have been adapting to new environments, new weather conditions, new climate cycles. Um, it's part of our whakapapa. And adapting, specific, specifically relocation or being mobile to environmental changes is in our whakapapa. And Alice Stewart wrote a really cool article a couple of months ago talking about our tipuna knew when to move, the difficult conversations about managed retreat for Māori. So really we need to look to our whakapapa to give us that resilience and power to know we can adapt moving forward in a world of climate change. Unfortunately, it is happening now. We just have to look to the Auckland anniversary floods, the um, devastation that Cyclone Gabriel has had in the uh, Tairangati region. It's happening now. 
Uh, we need to have these conversations and they are being had right now and especially at the central government level. Uh, how do we retreat or relocate or whatever, whatever word you want to call it? Um, how do we adapt? Um, and those conversations are happening as we speak. However, I want to share a story of resilience. And this story is even within my own whakapapa. Um, I knew that I knew this was a story, um, but I didn't really know how powerful it was until I started looking for them. And this forms part of my PhD, which I'll talk about later. But this story of resilience follows the 1886 Tarawera eruption. So Hapuniwi around uh, Mount Tarawera, which is south of Rotorua and Lake Tarawera, um, were devastated by a volcanic eruption, which not only uh, caused several fatalities, um, it also uh, wrecked the uh, tourism industry that was focused around the pink and white terraces of the time. So devastation was really what happened following that eruption. But Unfortunately, following that eruption, a lot of um, the hapu around the area, so specifically Tuharangi and Ngāti uh, the ones that we have worked with, um, they had to undergo some form of relocation. They could not uh, remain in this area. It just wasn't profitable at that time. So there was a relocation process that occurred. Having these histories and whakapapa of relocation is really important for us to understand how we move forward in the future. And through some of the kōrero that was shared with me with some of my komata, was that the past is really how you deal with the future. And this uh, one of our komata goes further to say that, you know, if we had something similar to that size event or something similar, even, even climate change, they go to note that we would still know that people would come offering bread, kai, whatever they could to support us. So that mentality and bringing those stories to the present is really important. And at the same time of learning about these stories and looking deeper into my own whakapapa, you know, adaptation is happening as we speak, not only globally, but also nationally and at that local scale. So here are just some uh, prompts to, of adaptation. So uh, Tangoyo community, uh, they're talking about adaptation as we speak, given the recent Cyclone Gabriel event. But also other things such as the para um, logic, which is protect, accommodate, retreat or avoid, which is really common in the coastal space. But also we have pieces of legislation and guidance being formed at the uh, central government level. So we have here on the right, the um, MFE Coastal Hazards Guidance uh, Decision-Making Wheel um, to sort of identify um, the impacts, um, how we engage with communities and how we develop those adaptation options and implement those options. So this is, all di uh, this is all evolving in this space at the moment. So what did I do? I wanted to look more to our histories, our whakapapa, to understand you know, what type of adaptation occurred, specifically relocation. Because in the past, through the wānanga that I had been part of, the idea of relocating, say, a marae or a pā or an urupā is a really tough subject to have a, to discuss for many, many reasons. But I wanted to bring those stories to light to, to showcase them, to showcase that resilience. So we know that, you know, our tūpuna have done it in the past and we can, if we need to, do it in the future with um, climate change impacts, sea level rise. So we sort of had two levels of analysis with this um, first piece that I've been working on. So we have um, a textual analysis. So we looked deeper into um, written records. So we looked into treaty settlements. We looked into Māori maps. We looked into papers past to identify where a pā, which could, which we're uh, broadly encompassing, a uh, marae, a pā, urupā, a wahi tapu, hapu or iwi, have relocated in response to natural hazards. So the uh, map on your right, uh, this shows the 51 cases that we um, highlighted, and the most common uh, natural hazard was a tsunami. Uh, this is shown by the symbol with the, the black sort of diamond with the white wave. Um, these were spread around the, um, around the country. But also we had other hazards such as flooding, so that's the blue diamond there, um, as well as coastal erosion, as well as um, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, those sorts of things. And what was interesting too was that these cases were across several timeframes. So 
quite a lot were before 1840 and they were predominantly the bigger natural hazards, so tsunami and earthquakes. And then from 1840 onwards, we start to get more of these contemporary things such as flooding and erosion. Um, we, we accept that this is just a subset of the data. There could be way more tied up in Kōrero and Pūrāko, um, but given sort of the scale of this, uh, we sort of stuck with the textual analysis, but it's, um, yeah, it just gives a glimmer of what, it, what the um, Tauranga is there. So we had that textual analysis, which is the national sort of scale, and we brought it down to a sort of a local case study with Tuharangi and Ngātirangi Tehi uh, specifically uh, to identify um, the potential enablers of that relocation following the Tarawera eruption. So through semi-structured kōrero, or semi-structured interviews, whatever you want to call them, uh, we I found uh, four sort of key um, enablers. So the idea of tokufin or gifting of land. So lands are given slash made available for um, hapu to relocate to. So one example is an offer of land that Tuharangi were gifted from Ngāti Māori, which is in the Coromandel region. Uh, they were gifted based on whakapapa connections to uh, between the two, and um, that was the uh, offer that uh, Tuharangi did take up uh, following the eruption. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it wasn't it wasn't a transaction, so there was no money involved. There was no um, it was reciprocal, and that was really shown in 1986 when that parcel of land in the Coromandel was gifted back. That just shows that reciprocity that existed in those times. And I think that's something that we can definitely take forward into the future, the idea of um, reciprocating um, reciprocating things and making sure that it's all balanced, I think is really important. Another uh, concept is the idea of autonomy in, in decision making. So a lot of our participants mentioned that there was strong leadership at the time, as well as being able to incorporate their mātauranga or their te ao Māori perspective into decision making. Um, that was really important. I think that is really going to be important moving forward in terms of climate adaptation and um, being innovative, leading in the space of how we adapt uh, specifically Māori communities, marae, urupa, all those things. I think that's a really important step moving forward. Another one is the perspectives of lands and infrastructure. Um, this is a piece that was shared, the idea of um, uh, one of our participants posed to me, like, how do you think it will actually happen moving a marae? And I you know, gave an engineering perspective, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, um, I don't think it's the bricks and mortar are the easy parts of relocation. It's the connections. How do you maintain those connections or how do you recreate those connections? And this, our participant talked about the innovation that needs to happen to innovate how those connections are maintained, which I think is really a, um, a really important thing to move forward. And also, land wasn't commodified like it is today. That's also that was an enabler of the past, but it's also a challenge today. Land isn't so easily given up or given away or or uh, sold because. Uh, we, we have a housing crisis in this country, we have a land shortage as well, so those conversations need to be had at a sort of broader level as well. But also the, um, the attributes of the relocation site that they were moving to, what were the opportunities like, what was the existing whakapapa? Um, one of our participants talks about, you know, the need for a tūranga waiwai, a place to stand, a place to connect, that's really important especially for this relocation process, to have those connections that are already there or establishing those connections. But also we have to be practical too. The land needs to sustain and care for the people to ensure that they flourish. There's no point moving to a new piece of land if it's not adding value or adding benefit to the people there. So there needs to be some sort of um, awareness in that and uh, making allowances to ensure that you know, everything is being met for the community's needs and wants and also delivering on their future aspirations as well. Now, I just want to share with you some of the, um, some really key quotes that were shared with me from some of my whanaunga in the interviews that I was doing. So one of them goes to talk about the modi, so the connections. How do we establish and recreate those uh, values and connections that place provide? It's going to be really important for a relocation process, especially for Māori, especially for Indigenous peoples more broadly, 
is being able to have that connection or re-establish that connection to whenua, to place, is going to be a really important um, challenge that's going to uh, come up with relocation. A more pertinent sort of um, quote too was, talking about if Mirai Hapuniwi cannot uh, see the evidence that's been shown that's going to be their potential futures, uh, there's no impetus to do something revolutionary. So we need to have that balance of evidence to supply and promote, or not promote, but to give to communities so they can make those informed decisions. Um, uh, relocation may not be the case for every marae, but if they don't have the evidence to show them what they need to do, they cannot move forward. So we need to have a holistic thinking around this to ensure that our communities are prepared and they um, can make uh, their decisions as well that they need to do. So I'm not quite sure how long I've been talking for, uh, but this is the end. So uh, some acknowledgements. So to my participants from Tuharangi and Ngāti Rangitehi, this, you know, Aroha to them because they have provided so much um, support for my work, and um, without them, this wouldn't have been a uh, this wouldn't have been possible. Also, to my whānau, my supervisors, so particularly my auntie Manuariki, who helped me um, connect to people to um, get this information. Thank you to them, RNC for the continued support, and I was also meant to mention earlier, but I forgot. Um, we also have a paper coming out which um, will talk about this and we will and it is going to be open access as well. But also more broadly, Lara Taylor and I are working on uh, hosting a Wananga to provide a submission to the community-led retreat and adaptation funding that, the, uh, that Parliament has just sent out. So we're hoping to gain some uh, perspectives into a submission. So if any of you are keen to partake and to provide your provide your feedback, provide your thinking around what a community-led retreat could look like. Um, yeah, please show your interest by scanning this QR code or making contact with Lara or I and we can uh, help facilitate that. Um, so yeah, kia ora, thank you. Ka pai, tēnā koe, te tūkana mō kōrero ko whāriki hia i tēnei ata. Uh, must have heaps of whānau from Tūhaurangi and Ngāti Rangi to you here because you're getting a lot of claps and hoorays and the in the chat with those functions they're saying I'm here hoa. Um, just a reminder to our attendees, if you do have any whātai, pātai, sorry, don't be shy, feel free to pop those into the Q&A function, uh, likely at the bottom of your screen. You can also keep yourself anonymous too. Um, and yeah, get those questions flowing because I know that our presenters are really keen to um, have a bit of a dialogue around that as well. And again, ngā mihi koe a kia koe a kuhata. I would now like to invite Benjamin Jones uh, to present on his kōrero. Uh, kia ora everyone, um, tēnā koutou katoa, roko koutou te awa, i hono aho, ki Bergtau Tamaki Makaurau, ko Ben Jones toko ingoa, i ka rangaho aho ke whare wananga o Tamaki Makaurau, he mehe nui, he mehe aroha, he mehe nui ana aho, ki nga tangata o te whenua. Um, uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Benjamin Jones, a doctoral candidate at University of Auckland, I'm also um, originally from South Africa, Please don't hold the recent um, All Blacks test against me. Uh, I support the All Blacks. Um, and I'm quite excited today to share a bit of my research. Um, you've, you've kind of seen the title. I just kind of really want to acknowledge my um, supervisors, particularly Mark Dixon, MRI, and Murray Ford, and Daniel Hikaroa, who's taken this kind of archaeologist on this journey to do his um, PhD. So I'll just jump straight into it. So I guess when I was talking to Ako Ho and Shari, we're talking about uh, quite often it's, you know, a lot of people don't even know what archaeology is or it seems a bit obscure or there's some bad connotations with it, which is understandable. So the presentation today is going to talk about what is archaeology and then kind of a bit about my PhD research of how cellular virus is potentially impacting these sites. And then kind of through this whole presentation is what can we learn from the past to prepare for the future from these archaeological sites? So archaeology broadly is just the study of the human past. Um, particularly looking at the things people leave behind. And it comes from the Greek word uh, archaeos or ancient. Um, and this is kind of a millennial meme format, but uh, quite often I think what society thinks that we do is the recent Indiana Jones movie, we kind of looters or treasure hunters, and that kind of comes from a history of ant antiquarianism. Um, but what I think I do is I mostly do a lot of reading. I'm trying to read other archaeologists' reports or trying to kind of meddle in science a little bit and understand the past a bit better. 
what my parents think I do is, you know, I'm going to exotic locations and getting in trouble. What my friends think I do is hang around at Dusty University. Um, and I guess what Indiana Jones wanted me to do is put everything in a museum. But what I think I really do day to day is, you know, work with communities, hapu, iwi, uh, other archaeologists to kind of just do a lot of paperwork and sample um, before sites are kind of lost to development. But that's another presentation entirely. Um, through the talk, I'm going to be talking about these different things. Um, so here's just some kind of glossary of it. So when I talk about erosion, just talking about, it, you know, gradually worn away or removed. When I talk about accretion of kind of adding sediment, I'm going to talk a lot about middens. Um, you know, from an archaeological perspective, a lot of people see these as refuse heaps or garden, garbage heaps. But um, kind of a point I took from Ari Carrington is the kind of libraries of the past because they contain so much information about the past that we can learn about human activity, what people were using to fish, what people were eating and where they were kind of moving and also kind of earthworks areas that humans have kind of leveled out. But what I thought I would do is share a bit some kind of some exciting research from other parts, um, other researchers, other archaeologists, and what they kind of learn from archaeological work in Aotearoa. First off, with Patricia Pillay, who's a doctoral candidate at University of Auckland. Um, Patricia's research kind of focuses on, for her master's research, focus on using kind of kuri or the Maori dog to look at how kuri were dispersed across Aotearoa. And what's going on? Uh, uh, interesting about her research, um, the more kuri are in the location, the more they're dispersed along um, New Zealand. And then that kind of changes up over time at the top here. Um, moving on to Reno, that kind of image in the background or fishbone that you kind of typically get from archaeological sites. And what Reno did for his PhD research is looking at 50 different archaeological sites around the northern North Island and looked at the effect of the Little Ice Age on Maori fisheries. And so that's kind of this kind of multicolor graph here, where it's kind of taking those fish bones, figuring out which of these fish were from different habitats, and then seeing how they changed over time. Um, we also have Brendan Kneebone, Andrew, Andrew McAllister, Dante, Alex Jorgensen, and I, Taiki Tamaki. And what they were looking at is how climate change and erosion is impacting a large flaking floor of where people were kind of making preforms. So before it turns into an ads and kind of understanding a bit more about um, man lithic manufacturing practices, how people were making stone tools in the past. And then just lastly, um, Emma Ash and Louise Rue from Auckland Museum were kind of looking at this kind of eroding midden, which you can kind of see in the background here. You can see the archaeologists working very hard um, and how that kind of uh, the layers of occupation through time and kind of try taking that kind of environmental and um, marine data to kind of understand modern baselines of more, um, contemporary biodiversity and terrestrial studies. So on to kind of my PhD research. So during that kind of work, archaeological work, um, what's kind of apparent is that newspaper articles and communities in Hapu and Iwi were very conscious of sites kind of eroding out. Um, and like you can kind of see with these newspaper articles that keeps um, popping up. And it's also a problem globally where sites in Libya, um, BBC, different people are talking about what is getting eroded on the coast is, I guess for the human, for most of the human history, a lot of the occupation was on the coast. And then if you look at academic articles um, around the globe, um, you can kind of see these are different studies, kind of the more studies there are, um, the more people are considering how sea level rise or climate change is going to impact um, cultural heritage or archaeology. You can probably see there's a bias here as I've only focused on, um, you know, English articles, I'm sure in South America and Africa, Japan, Southeast Asia, they're also considering this, but it kind of gives you an idea of the global um, problem and the global impact sea level rise will have on archaeology. Um, in New Zealand, we actually have quite a lot of archaeological sites. I'll just take this off for a second. Um, so this animation is just showing you um, in yellow all the sites across New Zealand that have been found by archaeologists or defined as an archaeological site by archaeologists, which is typically a whole range. That animation was just provided by Simon Bickler. And here you can kind Kind of see kind of the distribution on the North Island and South Island and pre-contact here just means before Europeans arrived there's probably a better term for it but that's kind of what we're using currently as archaeologists. 
Um, so the first part of my PhD was just looking at, okay, what is the risk nationally at the coastal level? And so here again, you can just see a map and kind of shades of blue. And the more sites there are in that hexagon, the more archaeological sites we have. And there tends to be kind of a coastal focus within that. And then what this kind of diagram is showing you, just the different site types we have as archaeologists. So burials kind of stand up, make sense. Again, I talked about a midden and then just how close they are to the shoreline. Um, I won't talk about too much about it today. Um, please, if you're more interested in this, check out the recent um, article. It's open access. We're keen for a lot of people to read it. But basically, the three main findings of the paper was a lot of archaeology is on the coast. Um, a lot of it is on uh, landforms that are sensitive to sea level driven erosion. So these are all these sites in um, red through here. And I kind of brought, brought home the point is that we need to kind of probably monitor and um, assess at a local and regional scale, you know, the, um, what's going to happen to these sites and how erosion is impacting it. And that's what kind of led on to kind of the next part of my PhD, which was looking at the future risk of um, archaeological sites and really using the RNC shoreline uh, mapping program um, driven by Mark Dixon and Emma. Uh, Ryan, which is taking all the historical photographs and then digitizing that shoreline. So here you can see 1961, um, that's where the toe of June was, and then in 2015, and then kind of looking at those erosion and accretion patterns and how that relates to um, archaeology. And so here's just a snapshot, I guess, of Northland of current erosion and accretion patterns. And so if you look at that central map, it looks like there's a lot of um, erosion and accretion happening. You have these big systems, so Kaipara Harbor, we have a lot of accretion and erosion. But what these kind of diagrams on the left and right are sh showing you is just over time, over the last 80 years, areas where um, accretion has been happening. So the positive and then kind of the negative erosion. So even though there's some um, erosion happening, most of it seems to be accretion or stable. But that's kind of the tricky thing um, with beaches is it, um, they're not linear. So this might change in the future. So what we wanted to do is take um, kind of the work of Tom Shand um, for the coastal erosion zone, where it's considering these different factors of uh, sea level rise, how the long-term rates of erosion and short-term erosion, and kind of put archaeology as the focus. So what we're quite keen to do is if you know Northland quite well, you know where all the black is, is where you mostly have infrastructure or housing. What we wanted to kind of do with um, the PhD is kind of take this coastal erosion hazard zone and apply it specifically for archaeology in areas of blue, where you tend to have archaeology, but not a lot of infrastructure. So kind of giving an update of what's the future risk to the archaeology. And that's essentially what the tool outputs, is it outputs these kind of scenarios or zones where we expect how the coast would react to erosion risk to different like sea level increments of so 20, 40, 60, 80, and here you can see the different types of archaeology in those zones where the triangles are mostly midden, but you also have some burials that's probably going to be impacted in the future with uh, 60 centimeters of sea level rise. Um, and this is kind of what is at risk. Um, so you can kind of see here you have the scenario of 20 centimeters of sea level rise, but you're probably going to lose, or you're probably going to have 40% of your archaeology in the coast and Northland affected. So you have about of total 579 sites. And so 40% of or 42% of that is going to be at risk to future sea level rise. But kind of what uh, really stuck out to me at this part of my PhD is okay, what now? There are bad news for communities. How are local communities dealing with current erosion practices that we can kind of see from that first paper and the shoreline rates um, shown by um, the shoreline mapping project? So I was really lucky to collaborate with Patiri Kekia um, and the Coastal Monitoring Program, where they're actively monitoring, monitoring if sites are eroding along Popo Whenua. But I will let um, Ari talk about um, this eroding midden. Hello, so I'm Patricia Colleen. I'm the NZAA Social Media Coordinator. I'm joined today by Ari Carrington, who is the Kaitiaki Monitor for Kaitiaki Tayao Unit. And we're here on Popo Whenua in Te Pai Pukaro, Northland. Kia ora, Ari. Kia ora. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your job and your work with archaeology? Yeah, 
So um, I work for the Patuharikiki Taiao unit, which is a part of the um, Patuharikiki Tiwi Trust Board, and our hapu here is Patuharikiki. Um, so I'm one of the on-the-ground um, kaitiaki, and one of our main parts is to um, capture and revive um, traditional practices. And one of them is um, we always like to manaki and work alongside um, different people that come into the rohe, um, especially archaeology. So um, that's one of the main, um, it's like the core of, of our work, working alongside archaeologists because we have so much being a coastal hapu. Um, yeah. And following from that, so from your perspective as a kaitiaki, what are the main threats to coastal archaeology? Uh, I suppose the main one is um, big storm events, um, so it's really important to be able to capture all that information before it gets washed away. So like as an example here, there's um, a midden that's up on the dunes, which is right next to the sea. Um, this one has been hammered by um, different events. Yeah. And what would you like to see from archaeological work in the future? Um, that opportunity to dig deeper on the Mātauranga side, the Te Ao Māori view of archaeology. So grabbing all those different bits and pieces of info that will help revive cultural practices within our hapu. So like, to me as an example, Midden is like a library of all sorts of different information that I would like to dig deeper in. Thank you so much, Ari, for sharing your knowledge with us and this to report it No worries. Yeah, so just a bit of um, more background um, of the midden. Yes, it's a, a LIDAR cross-section, so it's just showing you kind of 2D perspective of the topography, so you can kind of see the midden is very close to the shore, so um, the sea is over here, and so you can kind of see the erosion is slowly impacting, and that's what's kind of exposing that midden. And then if you look again at the RNC shoreline data, you can kind of see in red is that erosion, and it's kind of over the last 80 years, You've had kind of like minus about 20 meters of kind of erosion and then that's probably the reason why these kind of white dots which are the midden are getting exposed and if we move a bit forward so the idea was to kind of see what information we can salvage um, from this mission uh, midden and i think the key objectives were to find out how old it is and then potentially add some information about you know how um, the archaeology can be useful to kind of understand a bit more about the geomorphology. So here we just have some pictures of the excavation on the day. You've got Kirsten Roth excavating um, a bit of faunal bone, which turned out to be a, a young juvenile whale. Just a top-down picture of that black layer, which is the midden. Just kind of see is looking at the position of the midden on the beach facing north towards the refinery. And then you just have some more action shots and then kind of the uh, Mars rubber buggy is just a GPR, the ground penetrating radar machine where Xavier Watson and Becky Carrington are trying to kind of look underneath uh, um, the sand to kind of give an idea of the deepest stratigraphy. But um, some initial results from this is we were able to get the radiocarbon dates back. So here, just for um, uh, you have this kind of middle layer, it dates, we think, to about 250 years ago. And then you have the kind of dune sand and then you have this kind of paleo soil that dates to about 500 years ago roughly but what was kind of interesting is if we were able to look at the charcoal data um, Dr. Rod Wallace was able to identify if you take the charcoal under a microscope you're able to figure out what kind of tree it was so if one you can see there's mostly small shrubs um, species so Purukawa, Manuka, uh, Kanuka around 500 years ago which is quite interesting which you're probably using to make fires and um, in their cooking practices and then this paleo charcoal, which saw at the bottom, mostly has, um, you know, herbaceous material, which is interesting because um, uh, we'd expect to have, have some primary forest. And what we mean by that is kind of larger um, tree species. So that suggests that maybe initial burning has already happened and you've kind of seen that secondary regrowth. We mostly have bracken in that layer, but we, which is just kind of gives you an idea of what the environment was at the time. But what's interesting between these two layers is obviously the accretion of the sand and that even though um, we had an initial burn off, the, even the dune was adapting over time and accreting as people were using this coastal landscape. Um, and then finally, we um, kind of went back uh, after uh, Cyclone Gabriel to do a scan. What you see there is you see um, Xavier Watson 
using a tablet to 3D scan, which is this top image. And the cyclone has done a bit of a number on this um, midden. So this is before we excavated in 2020, third of October, you can kind of see you've got bits of midden that's slumped down. You see some slumps, but the midden's still looking pretty um, thick. But after the cyclone, you can kind of see that loose sand at the bottom has been removed. You've got more slumping and there's not much of the midden left. So eventually it'll probably go. And you can kind of see in the drone image, the quite they were quite intense scarp. And it was actually quite hard to even climb up and to do the 3D scan as well. And there's only a little bit of that um, mid and left and that black layer at the bottom. Um, but what we tried to do during our excavation as well is kind of having having a teaching day of Patiakiki Youth where we set up three different kind of like um, science stations where students were scanning or using the GPR or using um, the drone, uh, identifying just to kind of situate again what is archaeology, some coastal science, the threat to these sites and kind of part of that um, larger project. And I guess what really stuck out to me is before I started the PhD, this is kind of idea that archaeology is important to communities because somehow we can give information that has been lost. But I think what's really important, especially to sites impacted by sea level rise, is communities are quite important to archaeology because they're doing the monitoring, they're doing most of the mahi, and the, they're the ones that have the most meaning with these sites. And so it's really looking at local capacity and understanding how local communities can um, and how we can be useful for local communities and not just uh, and just come in and say we can do this kind of information. So just some kind of, I guess, recommendations. My PhD is finishing soon and I think where future work should go should really look at archaeology as a resource. Uh, who's going to pay for all this archaeology that's impacted, you know, you know, erosion is currently impacting archaeological sites. So when you, you know, we need to kind of look at um, different parts, not just Northland. So we really need regional local assessments. And then especially, I guess what Ari mentioned as well, what quarter or data or information needs to be captured before these sites are lost. And then again, how can we use local capacity to trigger decisions so when the community decides what happens to these sites. And so here is just an extra slide of um, the people People are interested. Um, Kevin Jones's book, Caring for Archaeological Sites, is really good. It's a doc um, publication because it talks about different vegetation strategies to plant archaeological sites. And then Heritage New Zealand released these two um, infographics related to caring for Urupai Mara after floods. And so, yeah, thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully, I've not gone over time. And I just want to mention the thanks to all the people there that have helped me, especially my supervisors, the people that have funded me, because definitely without their mahi and help, I wouldn't. Um, have been able to do any of these work really. So thanks again. And uh, Benjamin, awesome to see the corridor that you can tell through archaeology and um, <clears throat> the amazing mahi that you're doing in partnership with Mana Whenua. It's great to have allies uh, who understand the importance of working with and empowering um, our whanau, hapu and iwi to tell their own story, which is awesome. And lucky you support the All Blacks too, otherwise you probably wouldn't have been invited to this webinar. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, hand te rākou kōrero, uh, kia tūmanako rāo kua hau kapua nui, uh, who are going to share or give us a bit of an insight onto marae infrastructure resilience and natural hazard events. Don't forget, e hoama, put those questions through the Q&A chat. Tēnā kōrero. Uh, kia ora mai tātou, uh, ko Tūmanako Whaui Tōtu Ingoa, uh, he tēnei nō Te Arawa Waka, e kairanga hau au, uh, nō te heringa mātai pūkaha ki Wakawa Te Matarau, uh, tēnā koe te katoa. Uh, good morning everyone, uh, my name is Dr Tūmanako Whaui and I'm a lecturer at the Engineering School at the University of Auckland, Wakawa Te Matarau. I'm presenting here uh, with one of my PhD students, Hokopo Nui, uh, who will be doing a lot of the heavy lifting today because he's actually done a lot of the heavy lifting of this mahi. But I'd also like to uh, acknowledge our other supervisor, Professor Liam Witherspoon, as well as acknowledge a lot of the work that has gone into making um, this mahi possible, as well as the collaborations with uh, uh, Marai um, and Hapu and Iwi that have um, been working with us. Um, I also just like to acknowledge specifically uh, Dr. Conrad Zorn and uh, Amelia Lynn for um, help with the GIS material and some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. So uh, our presentation today is going to be talking um, and addressing the issue of 
infrastructure, um, engineering infrastructure for PA and Marae, and how we can look at vulnerability or look at, you know, in a positive sense, improve resilience for our whanau in light of natural hazard events. And you know, this is very much at front and center of many of our whanau's minds, given, given what's been happening and some of the changes we're seeing in the environment. So we're trying to address that from the engineering perspective, but also ensure that we are addressing also the cultural and aspirations of our founder Hapu and Iwi in terms of um, providing holistic solutions to some of these engineering challenges. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass over to um, Hokapu and Iwi to uh, introduce himself and start us off. <clears throat> Thanks, Timonoko. Uh, tēnā no tātou katoa, um, e ngā manu hiri tuārangi, tēnā no koutou katoa. Uh, ko hei kapua nui verkau tōku ingoa, uh, no ngā iwi o te aroa tū whare toa, te ati hau nui a pāpārangi, ngā ati kahungu nui ngā ati pāhauera, ngā ati raukoa, uh, me ngai tahu anō hoki. So kia ora everyone, my name is hei kapua nui verkau, um, PhD engineering student at the University of Auckland. Um, it's a pleasure to be, to be here today, so kia ora tātou. Uh, so the motivation for this research, uh, as Tumanako mentioned, is in light of the, the recent weather, high impact weather events we've been seeing uh, in terms of the increased frequency and intensity um, of these weather events and natural hazard events. Uh, so things like earthquakes, tsunami, landslides, those type of things. Um, and our particular focus is on marae or pā, uh, as these uh, locations are especially susceptible um, to high impact weather events and natural hazard events. And that's largely due to their geographic locations. So if you think about our marae that are out on the coast, they now have to think about things like sea level rise as Akuata touched on in his rangahau. Um, isolation, if they're out in a remote area and if one of the bridges go out, what do they do there? Um, lack of resources, as we know, not all of our marae millionaires. Um, and lastly, some of the infrastructure that they have, um, which is like the roads, free waters, um, systems, power network, telecommunications, some of them are quite aged um, or inadequate um, to serve the purposes of the marae. But despite all of these things, I know are still seen to lead the response and contribute towards civil defence efforts. Um, so if we think about moving into the future, if we want to use marae as communal response sites, civil defence centres, whatever we want to call them, we need to make sure that they can sustain themselves, but also the, bro the, the broader community uh, in these natural hazard events as well. So in terms of the aims, uh, we want to investigate the role of Māori knowledge, uh, mātauranga Māori, in natural hazard context, uh, evaluate the current status of marae resilience, um, regionally, nationally, locally, um, identify the potential exposure of uh, marae, their vulnerability and fragility, um, to an array of uh, natural hazards um, and climate change induced hazards. Um, so this kind of looks at the risk to each of our marae. Uh, assessing the impacts on the infrastructure um, and assets that service our marae as well. And then lastly, developing some solutions that are culturally suitable, acceptable um, for long term and short term natural hazard impacts and also considering impacts that are induced by climate change. Uh, so if we look at this tiny core pattern here, it's a visual representation of the problem statement, uh, which places whānau hapu and iwi at the centre, and the problem statement is founded upon the interweaving of mātauranga Māori uh, and Western science to address the challenges related to natural hazards, climate change and marae infrastructure. Uh, the scope of our mahi um, is regional but also national. Uh, so some of the mahi that we've been doing uh, are within the, the rohe of Te Arawa, Waikato and Te Taitokiro, which is Northland, in terms of the, the qualitative um, surveys that we've carried out. Um, but more recently, our primary focus has, has been uh, in the Te Arawa region, and that's just because that's where most of our whakapapa ties are. Um, but we're not limiting ourselves to just Te Arawa. We also want to extend the research to other marae that we have whakapapa with, uh, which are in the diagram to the right as well. And in terms of the methodology, how we're um, proposing to do this, we want to do this on two different scales, on a large scale and on a, 
it's more focus scale. So in terms of the broad regional one, uh, we want to do high level geospatial hazard mapping. Uh, so this is us using tools like GIS and kind of um, overlaying Mirai locations on the different hazard layers that we've got access to and also the infrastructure networks and seeing how they all relate to each other. So from Mirai to a hospital, what's the distance, how long will it take? or um, you know, um, um, Marae to a school, or Marae to um, the doctors, things like that. And then the next step is to overlay the hazard data and see which of these infrastructure networks would be susceptible to earthquakes or flooding and what have you. Uh, in terms of the narrow hapu focus, that's kind of uh, a more one-to-one -one individualized. We go in to do an on-site inspection, put it all with the whanau, we've got some questions that we've prepared. And what this hopes to do is um, provide an in-depth analysis from our engineering perspective, but also getting some qualitative quarter from the whānau, which will hope to inform <clears throat> the Mātauranga Māori side as well. And ultimately, uh, this will highlight the, the, the resilience and the key hazards pertaining to that individual marae. Um, so I guess just trying to ID the, the strong and weak points of the marae so we can come up with some appropriate solutions. Uh, and in this way, this fusion will help to provide insights for Marae individually, but also more broadly. So here's just some of the GIS mahi that we've done so far. And all of these dots are Marae around Aotearoa. So this particular one is the liquefaction susceptibility. We can see here uh, the fault lines, um, also peak ground acceleration. So that's how much um, the building would experience in an earthquake, the damage. These are all the marae that would be susceptible to a one in 100 year flooding event around the country. Uh, here we've got the tsunami evacuation zones and you'll see some of the dots. Those are the marae that fall within um, those zones. These are our marae nationally, we've got the rating network loaded in, uh, the power lines nationally. And then here we've got, these are all the different routes from a marae to, to a hospital, for example, within the Bay of Plenty. Um, the geothermal zones, the geology of Aotearoa. <clears throat> and then we can also zoom all the way in and see uh, the building parcels, the outlines in the marae itself. And this is just a wind map of the country, all low and high speed um, wind zones. So some of the initial findings that have been um, done in terms of the initial hazard mapping back in 2019, We've got here the tsunami evacuation zones uh, within different rohi around the country. Now, all the black dots of the marae, we've got some stats showing up here. So these are just summarized on the next page. Uh, so all in all, about one in five of our marae across the country um, are within these tsunami evacuation zones, which is pretty scary. Um, and then if we look at the flood maps, pretty much the same thing, number of marae and then the number of marae that would fall into these 1% um, AEP flood zones as well. This was back in 2019. Um, and then we've also done an updated number for 2023. So on the table to the right, you can see the, the differences between four years ago and now. So Auckland, 13% up to 31%. Uh, Bay of Plenty, 5 to 15%. And then if we cast our eye to Hawke's Bay, which is the, the scariest difference, we go from 14% to 53%. But yeah, all of these numbers are pretty alarming. And I think they speak for themselves. In terms of the qualitative quarter with our whanau within um, the initial Te Arawa surveys that we did, we found out that the majority of, of our marae had no awareness of the civil defence plans, the rohe. Um, there was a general consensus that there's a lack of resources supplied by anyone um, in these types of events, and they don't know where to look either. Um, and then, and that marae should invest in ablution facilities, so toilets, showers, and backup power supply. Um, so these were highlighting some of the gaps within the marae um, if funds became available. But overall, the marae within Te Aro were marked as moderately resilient with mild deficiencies across infrastructure and resourcing capacity. Uh, and there should be an improved collaboration between council, CDM groups, and marae. Um, but there's also that mutual desire 
um, for all of these entities to collaborate and we're seeing the fruits of that may happening now. Um, and then just lastly, uh, Māori are accustomed to providing for the multitudes, as we know, because of things like tangi. Um, we just, when the whanau need to turn up, they turn up. So work, workforce is definitely um, not something to worry about in these, in these types of events. Um, and we'll continue to keep serving our whanau, hapu, iwi and brighter communities on these kind of events moving forward. So I'll just pass back to you, Tim Lako. Hold up. Um, with, with this work, um, I think for us as the engineers, the part that is, is easy for us to do is the online or the, you know, the spatial and the modelling. But what's important for us to address is the people component and how our whanau actually um, are part of this. I think Akuhata said something very important that came from one of the corridor. The bricks and water are easy to move, um, and we, we can do that. It's, it's the connections at, at the place. And so for us, we, we take a perspective that infrastructure is an enabler of community, enabler of, of, of people to, to do things. And so to that point, it's important for us to um, have good relationships for the marae, the whanau, the haku, the iwi that we're working with, um, and which is why a lot of the Mara that we're working with uh, have we have fucker proper connections to, um, and ensuring that the whanau that are involved have uh, feel like they have ownership of this work as well and are actively involved within this to also ensure that the data that comes out is going to be in a, in a usable sense or in a usable form that is going to inform decision making and actually help in a practical way. So some of the things that we've done to um, address that has been to provide personalized for the, for the model and for when, when we've gone out to see them, personalized feedback based on the questions and, and investigations that we've taken, uh, we've, uh, taken um, the initial templates for help with um, marae preparedness, thinking about trying to get Mariah in the, in the mode of um, preparing for events. So thinking about a pre-disaster rather than a post-disaster, um, as well as thinking about other op uh, resourcing opportunities that are present. Um, and then this all comes together to provide insights specifically for these Mariah, but then hopefully to provide a wider insights that can be useful to um, all marae and because we're experiencing a higher um, rate of impact across the across the motu so it's important that we're able to uh, share this knowledge but it's also important that we do this in a way that is tika especially given the importance in the tonga of the research and of the matauranga that has gone and, and contributed towards us so that, to that point we've, we've been very careful about how we disseminate this more wider. So at the moment, it's been specifically with the marae that we're working with, but we want to ensure that we can provide this in a useful but tikka way to um, others as well. All right, thank you, Hope. So you've heard about some of these uh, initial outcomes, uh, I mean, these initial findings that we had, we've had. In terms of um, long-term aspirations, we want to provide really practical tools um, that can speak to both the engineering as well as the Mātauranga Māori side of infrastructure, recognising that infrastructure goes beyond physical. And for us as Māori, thinks about these social and cultural connections also. And how can we put tools in the hands of our whānau um, that can actually help them thinking about training also, what would that potentially look like? Or what maps would be helpful in terms of planning and decision making um, and on the flip side from a council or a regulatory perspective how could this enable better help for our whanau also uh, next slide please so, so coming back to um, if you remember from Ho's video where he showed some of the GIS tools we have a snapshot here of um, 
three marae in a very close proximity in um, Rotorua. So we can see here that these marae have the land parcels outlined in the building footprints in place as well. And these were sourced from publicly available data. Um, but then what's useful is if we're then overlaying some of the different hazard information, hazard data that we have, also just mentioning that this is constantly updating and constantly changing, which is also part of the thing that we need to be careful about. But we can see the different vulnerabilities that may be present. So um, we saw earlier the um, liquefaction susceptibility. Here we have presence of geothermal, no surprises everywhere. Um, and some of the other ones we can look at, for example, are uh, flooding. So this is the flooding extent across um, our three marae here um, in Ohine Mutu, Tom Te Kapua, um, Te Paru Te Wata, and Tiki in the middle. So we have, we, we could see, and if we were able to see the extent of where we would expect flooding to go, this would help in terms of decision making, as we could see what potential infrastructure assets thinking about the buildings as well as some of the other areas of interest would be impacted. What's not on here that we will, that we partially have and that we're looking to still develop is looking and understanding the lines of infrastructure and lifeline utilities and how they connect within these areas as well. And when we're engaging with Marae, we're able to add more detail to these specific very bare um, um, maps of the park thinking about what other infrastructure assets are on site, especially for these more rural or isolated um, scenarios where they won't be necessarily connected to the main lines and will have a lot of decentralized systems in terms of water, water, rainwater tanks or wastewater, thinking about septic tanks, things of the sort. Um, and so we hope that this is able to provide better decision-making and identification of better solutions. Um, next slide, please. Hope. So in, in closing, we've, we've heard a lot of the, uh, you know, all the speakers today have talked about the impacts and the core work that has gone on. Um, they have really come as a result of these um, natural hazard events. But we've definitely seen the devastation that these natural hazard events or these high impact weather events have caused, have caused across the country. And we can expect these to increase um, uh, in intensity and frequency with climate change. So we have a opportunity here to um, utilize the existing and, and new technologies and models that are being developed to um, inform our decision-making, but do so in a way that aligns with who we are as Māori and who we are as whānau, hapu and iwi, which will be different across the motu. Um, and important for us is we understand that it can be very easy in this digital age to have all this information, but um, when whānau and hapu are, are sharing important information with us, we have to be very careful with how we treat that information, uh, ensuring that they remain the key knowledge holders of that. Uh, and we're doing, if we are, if we do have the permission to use it, we're using it in a respectful way that is going to be useful. Um, and not detrimental in any sense. So with that, I'd like to again uh, acknowledge um, everyone that has joined the call. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Hotapu for um, hosting today, Kanuta Mihi Ki Apoe, and um, thank you all. Um, Ka rawe, oh, rangahau rangati, uh, rangati la kōrua. Uh, thank you both for sharing your kōrero and the amazing mahi uh, that you are doing in that space, you know. Um, rangahau that is going to be able to be practically applied for our whānau and hapu um, in the face of, um, you know, a lot of uncertainty and um, I'm sure more often reoccurring uh, natural hazards or events. So, tēnā kōrua. Uh, awesome to see a lot of the, the questions starting to flow through now. We must have a lot of Māori in the chat because even though I said just put it through the Q&A, we've got people asking questions in the chat. Must be from Te Arawa, you lot? Nah, just kidding, just kidding. We are going to have a little bit of a break. We're running a bit behind time at Horma, um, and I don't have a Spotify premium account, so I apologise in advance for any ads uh, between songs that you hear during our break. But mena hi ana, harikite whare paku. Put the kettle back on, stretch your legs, Alan will be back in about 10 minutes or so.
Okay, no mai hoki mai uh, e hoama i ngā mana e ngā reo no ngā kokunga e whao tō tātou motu no mai hoki mai ki tēnei wāna ngā ipurangi o tātou um, We've got about 15 minutes left for Q&A so I hope you've had a chance to to stretch your legs or to think about a pātai and submit that um, through our Q&A function um, because we've got our presenters ready and rearing to go to answer some pātai uh, and we are going to kick things off right now because we are a bit stretched for time and kind of just a general uh, part time for all of you real quickly how do we get more Maori working in these spaces what would have helped you on your journey and we can kind of start an order from presenter and answer that part time real quick um yeah so I'll go uh, I think I already gave my answer in the Q&A um but at least for me it was having uh Māori science teacher was really helpful and um, seeing someone who looked like me in these spaces sort of showed to me that it was a potential pathway and I think that was really um, pivotal for me going into the sciences so yeah at least that's my sort of perspective pass it on to the next one Kia ora Ben uh, uh, Kia ora um, I guess from that perspective um, a chronic problem in archaeology is not having enough um, uh, Maori archaeologists and I think Ari's um, short video talks about that and so I guess from my perspective is just trying to be in listening to different iwi and hapio and being the best kind of ally I can be to kind of hopefully think about how can I teach what I'm doing in an edu education, educational way so that I guess uh, more young people want to become archaeologists I guess and so it kind of removes that negative perspective of it. I think for me um just being able to kind of similar to Aku, being able to see more more Māori in these spaces. I think I, I didn't even, when I thought engineering, when I was coming up through school, I thought it was, you know, I, only one thing didn't realise it could have all these other, could do all these other cool things, let alone, you know, be very useful to our whānau and hapū. So I think getting more exposure out there and more things like this. Yeah, no, total koe ngā kōrero. Um... Yeah, I reckon you can't be what you can't see. So I think it's also our job to like go into Kura and stuff and promote this, show them that there are people like them that are doing this mahi too. Kia ora, tēnā koutou. He kano hiki te, eh? That seems to be the common theme. And I feel like Hakapunui must have um, quickly Google searched that quote because that was on eho. Too much. All right. Pātai for Akuhata. Regarding your mahi e hoa, have you seen any planned adjustments around policy or legislation to support the retreat model? For example, I've heard insurance companies may not pay out claims for properties who are in the red zone as they are in a known coastal erosion site. Any updates on this matter? Yeah, it's a really good question. And my brain sort of went straight to the Climate Change Adaptation Act which is coming in following the RMA reforms. And that's sort of up in the air at the moment. Not much has really been said. Um, in regards to those insurance payouts, uh, this is a really rapidly developing space. And the way that sort of decisions are made are in a reactive manner. So in response to a hazard event occurring, not necessarily in anticipation of that hazard event, hence, um, rapid changes are happening you know quite quickly and maybe the time that's needed to be given to these big decisions to ensure that they're done properly maybe isn't necessarily the case and working this policy space we've also got the election coming up um, that will definitely throw a potential spanner in the works in terms of what legislation gets put through so at the moment it's still very up in the air um, there's nothing quite definitive being put through and um well, for instance, the uh, submission that Parliament's asking around the community-led adaptation and funding uh, model uh, that just shows that um, they're trying to gather information right now to make those um, policy changes and decisions. And just a reminder for all of those that uh, have tuned in, this has been recorded and will be sent out to everyone that registered to view today, so don't feel like you've got to miss out if you need to duck out um, as well. But our next part are here is for Harukapu Anui and Tumanako. Can we gain access to the qualitative data on the existing case studies? Please, question mark. I'll pass that one to Tumanako. I think that's an ethics question. <laughs> 
Yeah, so at the moment, it's, it's still being, it's still in the process of uh, carrying it out, really. Um, and we, we're still working with our mother. And so we need to, I guess, go through the process. But the intention is to, yes, to pro provide these because we want these to be um, informing it and helping it as many of our fun as possible. Uh, but, you know, like I said during the presentation, we, we have to first and foremost ensure that we are, are doing that in a way that is, um, you know, tika and, and, and uh, aligns with what our whanau and hapu that are working with us and trusting us with this mātauranga are happy with. So as long as really it, our whanau that are happy for us to share, we, 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 we intend to share. Kapai, tēnā kōrua. Uh, so for Hokapu Nui, is your G GIS mapping work publicly available online? Uh, if so, how can they access the mapping and findings regarding the various impacts of tsunami, flooding, earthquakes, liquefaction on Marae? Um, thanks for the question. I think at the moment um, we haven't shared it um, publicly online because um, we're still trying to work through some stuff, but also to think about um, making sure that it doesn't get in the hands of the wrong people. So if you think about insurance companies, if they get access to their data, like for the tsunami evacuations, for example, or the flooding, they might go and target all of those marae um, that are within those zones and put their premiums up. So that's what we don't want to do. Um, but I think for now, it's just working with the marae, as Tim Knuckles said, just sharing it between um, us and the marae and seeing what they reckon. Um, but I'm sure stuff can develop more in the future. Maybe Tim Knuckles got more insights on that. Yeah, that is the ultimate intention. We, we don't really want this to live and die as a, um, something that just lives on a few uh, on our computers and that's it. We want this to be available more wider. But you know, especially when we have complexities of many marae, all this information, as well as the hazard data and hazard modeling that is always... Um, changing you know there's some some good thought needs to be put um, behind it so we don't really want to rush it and get out put out something that's going to provide bad information for our whanau we want to um, provide things that are going to be useful and provide some good indication moving forward um, yeah so I think we've had a few part-time come in along these lines and I think the general answer is that uh, with the consensus and agreement of mana whenua, uh, and in time is probably the general responses to these partai. But definitely, I think, you know, the technology and the way to navigate the GIS mapping and those sorts of things, um, for sure, will be will be provided in time. Um, so, oh, do you have something else to Manako? Oh. Just, just, just on there, mm -hmm. I think if people... Uh, it would be good to see if, if people are interested at least in being being kept up to date. I think we're probably inundated with requests to be a part of the of the research and we wanna we don't really want to stretch our stuff so we're not helping anyone. Um but I think if you do at least want to be kept up to date, um it wouldn't be too much work to put together an email list of Marai. We already have ones that we've been working with, but to at least like a list to for any updates in terms of if you know, data gets released, for example, access to different software is made available. So I'm, I'm going to throw Ho under the bus and you can put Ho, if you can chuck your email up and email this guy and then we'll, we'll keep um, um, track of, of your, you know, your whanau, your marae to then be able, if, if things come out, we can then keep you up to date or even if you're interested to see how this research is progressing periodically um and then we'll, we'll let you know so how if you can um I'll put your oh there you go we put you put his email in there already bye bye great response and answer uh next part i for akuhata are you looking at relocation time frames as a part of your mahi for example in the case of our pa relocating how many relocated uh, are relocated permanently did some return when and why, or is it a future postdoc? <laughs> Kia ora, Christy Lee. Um, uh, yeah, so we did look at timeframes. However, the data was really sparse. So some, some examples had a year, some examples didn't have a year. Um, however, there was one example 
where the hapu re uh, returned back to where they um, had relocated from um, following a tsunami event. So that sort of return has happened as well. But yeah, I think it's definitely something for future research, future mahi looking into that sort of thing. And I think that'll probably give us a, an indication of um, more uh, attributes of the site that they relocated to. But then also for those that did return, like what were the what were the pulls that were pulling them back to that to that spot? You know, what was what were the important um, connections that were existing there? So. Yeah, definitely not a, another PhD for me, another PhD for someone else to do. But um, yeah, definitely. And just in case anyone's wondering, Ben has been asked a bunch of questions too. He's just responded to them directly in the chat. Um, so next part time for Tumanako and Haukapuanui. So when you're identifying risks to marae and the infrastructure, are you providing solutions on how you could improve their resilience to hazards? Uh, yeah, I think we're um, compiling a list of um, potential solutions. Um, that's one of our goals to um, develop adaptations for each of these things. So if we think about flooding, um, so Aku touched on relocation and manage retreat. Um, there's also other things that we can consider like nature-based defenses. So um, in terms of restoring like wetlands, uh, you've also got the hard engineering structures. Like uh, if you want to put a seawall in or something like that or flood barrier, but then again, you have to consult with the whānau and make sure that it's acceptable because, yeah, it might work, but the whānau might not be keen for it. Um, so just trying to balance the, the solutions versus um, the general acceptance, but also consider uh, the temporal benefits, so if it's short or long term, and also the cost, including ongoing maintenance, I think are the key things to consider there. Kapai, tēnā koe, awesome pātai. Pātai to everybody. <clears throat> when undertaking your rangahau, in your view, is the government's current national adaptation plan fit for purpose? Or were there any major gaps in the approaches central government is taking in relation to the impact of your research? So I know uh, Akurata talked about this a little bit, but maybe you want to expand on that, Ehoa? Um, so what was the question again? I just had a mind blank. Question it was about um, current legislation, hey? Yeah, so uh, is the government's current national adaptation plan fit for purpose? Mm -hmm. Or were there any major gaps in the approaches the central government took in relation to the impacts you have researched? Mm -hmm. um, I think, at least the national adaptation plan, it makes a uh, mention, it has like a section about uh, it's the tetiriti uh, led uh, adaptation approach. Like there is a section for that delving deeper into that. So I think there's that section there that is supporting specifically Māori communities. Um, however, I think there's sort of a, and I think this is a disconnect across many different um, spaces, is from sort of that bigger picture, central government down to the local scale. We make assumptions at that national level, central government level, and make assumptions that it would work at the local scale, and that's not necessarily the case. So we've got to be careful how we um, how we word things, how we portray things in terms of engagement of communities or understanding people's values, because it's very different at the local scale. I know there was another question around how do we manage multiple cultures when we're talking about adaptation. And I think that's where that local scale, um, proper, effective, early engagement with communities is really the crux here being able to gather everyone's perspectives at that local scale will really help uh, the, broad, the broader picture, but also down the track in terms of adaptation buy-in. You know, people and communities are part of the process, are part of a transparent process. Um, there's a higher chance of being uh, having community buy-in to whatever options you go forth with. So I think that disconnect is something that, um, is getting worked on, but I think it can be better. And I think that's across the board, uh, going from the bigger down to the, the smaller. And I think that's a challenge that we all face, especially with some of our work at that national scale. Mm. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add into that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just add very quickly. I, I, I agree with Aku Hatsu said, you know, I, the challenges, my perspective will definitely come translating 
big legislation to what that actually means in in practice for hapu. We we you know even we there's even a lot of times disconnect or misunderstanding between iwi and hapu. So you go all the way up to to government that is going to be um, magnified um, a lot. So having the view from the top whilst also understanding what's happening at the grassroots um, is going to be the challenge to make sure that happens and to ensure that it achieves the aspirations that it says it has in terms of um, supporting Māori in the face of climate change. Oh boy. And uh, final question before we finish our webinar for today and a question for all of you, should you feel the need to respond real quickly. Uh, what do our marae need to do now to make themselves resilient? And we've got a couple suggestions there, marae emergency management plans, emergency management training, first aid training, storage containers for generators, blankets, et cetera, coastal walls. Kia ora koto for Karo in closing. Sweet, I'll start off. Um, yeah, I, I totally took all of those things that you've listed. Um, I think some other things we should consider is decentralised infrastructure. So if you think about water tanks, um, if, if our marae connected up to the local water supply, if there's an earthquake and the pipe breaks, at least we've got our own to to support our whanau. Um, or if you're out in a remote area, um, it's important, I think, to have our own um, water source uh, storage and supply as well. That's all I could add to that list. I think there's, at least from my perspective, I think there's real value in one having those conversations and starting the discussion, but also being aware of who else is around you is in this space. What are they doing? Who are the experts? Where can we get some money? Uh, what pieces of legislation is um, important? I think having a handle on those sorts of things is also really valuable. So when the time comes, at least in sort of an adaptation sense, uh, you know we can get some pute to do some planning or who can you um, contract in to do some piece of work for the marae or hapu. I think just having a handle on that um, would be very valuable moving forward. Just quickly adding on to that, I think that connection is, is very important. Not only connection for our own, just the marae, but how are we connected and who else is around us? Like what well, I said, you know, we come together as, as community. So we need to understand how we can support not only our own but others as well, as well as having those connections to the relevant support networks and good connections. There's, these connections aren't always good with, with seeding, for example. Um, yeah, I think I totally, totally agree. And I think maybe just, I guess from the heritage perspective, just having kind of a management plan, part of ecological management plans and just, I guess, one of the challenges having it mapped and then, I guess, as archaeologists, making sure we're sharing the information with the relevant um, mara as well and then um, making those decisions or giving guidance but not saying this needs to happen because some communities might want to, not the archaeology touched at all and, and might just have to erode away, which I think as archaeologists we have to be ready for that to happen. Karawe. Well, that brings us to the end of our <clears throat> of our webinar today. Um, just a reminder, this has been recorded and will be sent out to all of those that have registered. Uh, but a big thank you to our presenters, uh, Ben, <clears throat> to Manako, Haukapunui and Akuhata, uh, <clears throat> for the kōrero and mātauranga that you guys have shared today. I know it's been really valuable for all of those in attendance. Uh, and to those of you that have attended, thank you for taking the time. I know everyone's busy and got whānau things and commitments to do. So thank you for making time uh, to be present, to listen, to ask questions. Um, and I hope that you've taken something useful away uh, from the wānanga today that you can then apply to your own whānau, hapu, iwi, community, aharane. Um, and if you want to find out more about the Resilience Challenge or what these guys are doing, uh, or the other amazing kaupapa Māori researches and practices we have within the Resilience Challenge, uh, then please follow us on social media or head to our website at the Resilience to Nature Challenge. Uh, Maku to tata hui e whakakapi. <clears throat> kia tāre wa tūnga ki te kōrero ki te rangi koe a tēnei te whakawātea ki nei tūturu whakamau a kia tīna, tīna, haumie, huie, tāai ki e. Mā te wai te iwi. <clears throat>